Welcome to the Neuro Matrix. Welcome to the Neuro Matrix update week. Oh crap, that was the wrong one. How's everybody doing today? I am so sorry I sent you the wrong clicker. That was for my Psych 150 class. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing today? I see we have Andrew, Andrew in the house, Angeline in the house. Um, uh, Erica hopefully should be here momentarily. Anybody else? Shaoshen, you here? If you're in, go ahead and say hello. Be good to talk to you as well. Everybody, looks like we're running on a small delay. Hello, Ali, good to see you as well. Uh-oh, we're losing a lot of viewers. Is the sound okay? How's the video? Is it choppy or pretty smooth? Looks like it's pretty good on this side. Ah, oh, very good. Shaoshen just checked in on Remind. Good to see her. Good, good, good. The sound is good and the video is good. The internet connection's a little bit weak here at Wake Tech today, and I'm not exactly sure why, uh, but hopefully it won't cause us any technical difficulties. Um, I'm sitting in front of the museum, uh, inside the museum here uh, that used to exist in Washington, D.C. They closed this down probably about six months ago. But this was a great archive of news and news history. Um, and it was a fabulous uh, trip uh, to this place. And my favorite part was the Cartoon Alley where they showed you some of the cooler uh, cartoons that have been around in the last 50 years. Hello, Lorena. Good to see you. Mel, Mel, good to see you. I hope your head's feeling a little bit better. Melanie, uh, she's been suffering with some migraines. You folks have probably heard her talk about it in class. I hope you're feeling better today. Um, and Erica, are you here yet? Hopefully Erica's here. All right, let's go ahead and get started with, uh, oh, by the way, before we get started, uh, the exam is done. Uh, don't worry if you didn't do as well as you thought. There's more time to improve your grade, and there will probably be a little bit of a curve in this class anyhow. Just keep working hard, uh, keep coming to class, and keep doing your extra credit on your collaboration, and you will be fine in this class. Does, oh, cool. So have you ever been to the uh, museum, Mel? Uh, I would actually like to live there. I'd like to move there and live there. I don't care if I have to live in a crappy, teeny, tiny, little efficiency apartment. I just want to check out uh, the big city. Actually, San Francisco would be better, Chicago. Uh, I just want to live in a big city. I am tired of being a suburban guy. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. They closed it down due to lack of funds, Melanie, so that's kind of a bummer. All right. Cool. Well, I tell you what, we're 103. Let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, Chapter 5, we're going to be talking about cognitive development in infancy. Remember I told you uh, cognitive development this week and then socio-emotional development this week, next week. So this is the second of three weeks about what goes on in infancy. We're going to talk about Piaget and his theory, uh, and we're going to talk about assimilation, accommodation, and the four stages of cognitive development suggested by Piaget. We're going to talk about the limits of Piaget's theories, and uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about uh, research in infant memory uh, today. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk uh, about language development in infancy. All right. So, uh, Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget offered the first uh, theory of cognitive development. His theory suggested that human minds unfold in four distinct stages. I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And he argued that our mind evolves through four broad abilities. Did we talk about this in this class a couple of weeks ago? I, uh, I just talked about this in my intro class, so I'm not sure what I told them and what I told you. Um, 
but he offered a theory of cognitive development. Now, Jean Piaget actually started out as a biologist. He published his first scientific paper at the age of 15, and he published half a dozen scientific papers on mollusks before he was a junior in high school. In fact, he is so awesome and was so prodigious that he was offered the position of the curator of his local museum in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. He turned it down uh, to finish up high school. Uh, I hate this guy's freaking show off, right? He's so, he's so good. Um, and so he was actually a biologist. His uncle saw that he was a great biologist and, and thought that uh, Jean needed to also focus on the classics and the humanities. So he started teaching him philosophy. Um, and Jean Piaget kind of became interested in the combination between philosophy and biology. He wanted to understand the biological process of knowledge development. All right. So philosophers study how we know things, and he wanted to study the biology of how we know things. And he thought that you could use sort of a biological model to explain how the human mind evolves. And so he spent many years doing small experimental studies, lots of observational studies, and he actually developed the theories we're going to talk about today while doing case studies on his three infant children. Okay, and he thought that there were uh, two driving forces in cognitive development. Number one, he thought small abilities always tended to combine themselves into bigger, more complex uh, uh, abilities and behaviors. So he argued that human beings, biologically, our processes are always organizing towards more complex and more effective behaviors. Right? So you learn how to close your hand, you learn how to move your arm, and then as a human being, you're going to learn how to put those two behaviors together. Once you learn how to close your hand and move your arm, you might then throw a shoulder move into it. And so he argued that human beings are all, always organizing, and so mental structures tend to organize themselves. As you learn two simple facts, you automatically begin trying to put them together. And he referred to learning as equilibration, which is learning how to use your abilities to operate in your environment most effectively. So we argued that that was the driving forces. We have these simple abilities that combine themselves into more complex abilities, and these more complex abilities allow us to utilize and work in our environment as effectively as possible. And if you think about it, bats learn how to use their environment most effectively. The wild cat learns how to use its environment most effectively. And so you can think of learning as you learning to adapt to the environment in which you are placed. So we argued that we have these two primary forces that drive all human mental development, organization and equilibration. Now, he argued that you can think of the, uh, you can think of what is the, okay, in chemistry, we break things down until we get to the single unit of, uh, of what, an, what an element is. We get down to an atom, right? So what is the atom of intellectual functioning? Uh, Piaget would argue that the atomic part, the unit of learning, is what he called a scheme, a basic unit of knowledge. And it's any action or mental representation that organizes knowledge. Here's a scheme. If you want to, if you see something, if you want to see something, look at it. That's a scheme. If something's over here, you combine, uh, wait, and if you want to turn your head, you move it this way. Those are two schemes, looking at something and turning your head. And you know what? Human beings begin to organize those two simple schemes. And if we hear something over here, we learn to combine those two schemes, turn my head and look to see something that is beside me. So you can think of a scheme as the basic unit of knowledge. And it's as simple as a behavioral unit that allows you to do something. And it's also uh, as simple as an idea of what something is. So if I say dog to you, two or three associations pop up in your mind. Wet nose, floppy hair, furry hair. And that, in a sense, represents your scheme of what a dog is. Okay? 
Hello, Ebony. It is good to see you. And Melanie is right. The Spy Museum is actually one of the coolest museums in Washington, D.C. They actually moved it, Melanie, to a bigger place. It was super cool. It's got the history of real spies and also the history of James Bond. So it's kind of a nifty uh, and it's got spy activity. So it's really nifty. So a scheme is the basic unit of knowledge. And what he argued is we have these schemes that we change as we use them. So he argues that each scheme is driven through two processes. Number one, if we learn how to do something, we learn to use it in as many places as we possibly can. Okay, so the first scheme that a baby learns is to suck because that feeds the baby. That's a simple scheme that the baby learns. You know what the baby then does? They try to put everything they can in their mouth to see what is good to suck. So in a sense, the child is assimilating their scheme to all the different places in which it would work. Does that make sense? And if you think about it, babies, first they learn to suck the breast or the bottle to get food. Then they learn to suck a pacifier. Then they learn to suck their thumb or their toes. And then babies begin putting stuff in their mouth. So all of these is a baby assimilating a simple scheme to as many places in the world as it possibly fits. Does that make sense? Now, the baby through experience is going to learn that some schemes don't work in some places. And then what they're going to have to do is change these schemes in order to make them more useful. All right. So the scheme I always like to talk about is my son learning the word dog when he was 11 months old. OK, he learned the word doggoo. And you know what? We took him to different places and he learned to assimilate that scheme everywhere. And he learned that some dogs are big, some dogs are small, some dogs are furry, some dogs uh, are not furry at all. And he assimilated that scheme everywhere. But we took him over to a friend's house who owned a cat. OK, and he walked in the house and you know what he said? Can anybody tell me what my kid likely said when he walked in the door and saw that furry four legged thing? Can somebody tell me? I'm going to wait just a second, see what we get. Absolutely. Melanie, you've heard this lecture before. I'm hoping somebody else knows it too, right? He said dog and we all laughed and we said, no, son, dogs go bark, bark and cow cats go meow, meow. All right. So he then had to change his scheme of what a dog was. It wasn't just a four legged furry animal. It was a four legged furry animal that makes a particular sound. So he had to accommodate his scheme. So here's the deal. According to Piaget, we start with these basic units of, that organize knowledge. They can be physical or they can be mental. And what happens is these small schemes begin organizing into more complex schemes that allow us to equilibrate or, uh, foc or, or function in our environment. All right. Now, these schemes change because we adjust. We use these schemes through experience. We learn that these schemes can be used certain places. And we also learn to change these schemes when they're incomplete. Does everybody understand the two sort of the driving forces of cognitive development, according to Piaget? Now, he argues that our brain, that our mind, our mental functioning, goes through four different equilibrations, if you will. So it is sort of set to function in four different mindsets. And what happens is uh, three different times we will realize that our our mind is not well adapted to the environment, so it evolves. And so he argues that your mind evolves through four different ways of interacting with the environment. So he had four broad stages of cognitive development. I'm not going to do too much because I'm going to revisit each one of these stages um, later on this semester. So when we get to early and middle childhood, I'm going to talk about the pre-operational stage. When we start talking about adolescence, I'm going to come back and talk about the concrete operational stage. And then when we come back and talk about adulthood, I'm going to talk about the formal operational stage. But basically, he argued that our mind evolves into four distinct uh, manners of functioning. All right. So the first two years we are pre-symbolic. 
From two to seven, we are symbolic, but not logical. From seven to 11, we are logical, but not abstract. And after about the age of 11 or 12, he argues that the mind becomes logical and abstract. So do you see how the mind evolves? So first, you don't even have symbolic ability. Then you're symbolic, but you don't make sense. You don't have logical ability. Then you learn how to be logical, but only about things that you can see or touch. And then we evolve to where we can think logically and abstractly about objects in our world. So he argued that the mind evolves through these four different stages. Today, we're going to just talk about the sensory motor stage. All right. He argued that this stage of thinking is a pre-symbolic stage, which lasts from about birth to two years of age. And what he argued is during this stage, we, go, we use our senses and our motor behaviors to organize a symbolic understanding of the world in which we live. We learn the laws of physics. If you drop something, it falls. If you throw something, it flies. If you push something, it moves. We learn all of the rules of physics and all of the symbol, uh, symbols for the objects around us, and we begin to develop the ability to form mental representations. So he argues during this stage, we construct a symbolic understanding of the world. Uh, now, here's the neat, the weird thing. If you test a child during this stage, since they haven't fully developed this symbolic ability, what he discovered was that children will show some pre-symbolic limitations in their thinking ability. All right. So he argues that a child is considered sensory motor until they have two fundamental understandings about the world. The first is object permanence, and the second is objective self-representation. All right. Now, what Piaget found in playing with his three infant children was that he could show them a toy that they really liked and he could put it down in front of them and cover it up with a washcloth. And if the kid couldn't see it, they would quit looking for it. They would just pretend that it never existed. And so what he believed was that children before uh, sometime in the second year do not have the understanding that objects can exist if the child can't see it. That's why he argued they were in the sensory motor stage. He argued that they're trapped in the, their senses, what they can see, and their motor behaviors. And what you'll find is, in fact, there's tons of evidence on the internet, and I think I even have one in your course resources folder, of a little child demonstrating failure of the object permanence task. So if you'll see right here, they show this kid the little blue monkey on the left picture. The kid really, really, they establish that the kid loves the blue monkey, but, and the kid will be reaching for it. You can clearly tell that they, have, that they like the blue monkey. They then drop the white board down between the monkey and and the child. Now, what they argue is if the child keeps trying to reach around the white board, the child knows that the monkey's there. But what you'll find is that the child will look away just like this one does, almost as if the monkey is not there. Piaget thought that children didn't have object permanence. The other thing you will find, they have, it's called a mirror test or a mark test. What they'll do sometimes is they'll put red paint on a child's forehead when the kid's and without the kid knowing it. So you just might go up to the kid with paint on your hand and you touch their forehead and you put a red smudge on their head. You then send them in front of a mirror. Now, if you walked in front of a mirror and saw red paint on your forehead, what would you do? You would wipe it off. And so what they want to see is, will the child look and notice the little red mark on their forehead. And you see this little girl is looking intently into the mirror right now. And what they want to see is if the kid touches the forehead, that to them is demonstration that the kid knows they are looking at themselves in the mirror. And knowing that you are an object is what we would call objective self awareness. And if you look in the course resources folder or on the internet, you will see tons of demonstrations of, of uh, animals and people demonstrating either the ability for objective self-representation or not self-representation.
In fact, we used to believe that only humans had objective self-representation. But it turns out that you will see objective self-representation in lots of fairly evolved animals. <clears throat> any questions so far? <clears throat> Does this make any sense? Anybody following me? Anybody bored yet? Okay. So, in a sense, uh, this is sort of the six stub stub stage model of the sensory motor period. And I'm just going to go over this kind of quickly. Okay. He argued that we're all born with reflexes. Remember, I told you that we all have reflexes. And he argued that these reflexes just occur without thinking. However, he argued that over the first month or two of life, we realize that these reflexive behaviors lead to pleasurable experience. So when we suck, which is a reflex, the tummy feels good. So we learn that there is actually an affect that comes with a particular reflexes behavior. So in a sense, he would argue we accommodate that reflexive schema that we have. And he argues during the uh, uh, primary circular reaction, we then learn to do things to our body that feel good. So putting things in the mouth, because it makes the tummy feel good. And so he argues that we move from simple reflexes to these primary circular reactions that make our body feel good. He argues after a while we then learn that we can act on the external world to produce uh, to produce pleasurable experiences. So there's research to suggest that if you tie uh, a, a, a little piece of rope from a baby's foot, up to a mobile, the baby will be kicking the foot accidentally at first, but then they'll notice that the kicking of the food make, foot makes the mobile move around and babies like that little motion. And so the baby will then go from accidentally kicking their leg to voluntary kicking their leg because they're moving the mobile that they can't reach. This is what Piaget would call a secondary circular reaction. You've now no realized that you can make the world do things and produces pleasurable effects for yourself. Now, you then coordinate these external activities together in what we would call coordinated second, secondary circular reactions. And then we actually become, if you will, kind of exploratory or scientific in our attempt to coordinate these secondary reactions. And he argued that this leads to the more complex tertiary circular reactions and the interest in novelty and curiosity. So hopefully this makes sense. We go from reflexes to learning that we can make our body feel good. We then learn that we can interact, we can do things in the world to make us, to give us enjoyment. We then learn to put these simple behaviors together to create more complex behaviors. And we then become little scientists testing these complex behaviors. And if you've ever tried to feed a 10 month old baby, you'll notice sometimes they have tons of fun throwing their spoon on the floor. And then you'll pick it up and put it on the, uh, put it on their tray and they'll throw it down again. And they're doing it because number one, they want to see, they, they like it when it falls on the ground and they know that by throwing it on the ground, you'll pick it back up. So it's sort of double fun for them. So he argues that they're sort of being little scientists and they're learning the rules of the world. You need to know, uh, uh, do 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 do, um, just this, maybe the uh, substage order, the substage order, Mel Melanie. And then he argues by being experimental this way, we develop an internalized scheme or a symbolic ability. All right. So Piaget talked about how we developed over the first 24 months. Now, this is sort of a, a, a criticism of his entire theory, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and present it here. And when we talk about the other stages, I'll represent this, this general idea. But here's the thing. Most of his research was done with case study methodology. He studied his three children. Uh, generally, experimental psychologists don't accept case study methodology as a general practice. Now, Piaget did his research in the 30s and 40s, way back in the day uh, before it, uh, psychology was really established. So his methodologies uh, were more accepted then than they are now. So 
people suggest that his methodology was a little bit shaky. Um, he was kind of specific about these. He was kind of vague about the specific abilities that children developed. So he didn't talk about what kinds of abilities children developed or how these abilities combine themselves together. So he didn't talk about memory. He didn't talk about attention. He didn't talk about depth perception. He missed a lot of these. Uh, he didn't talk about con about specific details. He just talked about a general developmental structure. So he was kind of light on the details of what happened, right? And then also his estimates, a lot of people pointed his estimates as being too conservative. So in a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about Neo-Piagetian research. And basically the Neo-Piagetian or modern cognitive approach spends a lot of time demonstrating how children can do things that Piaget did not think they could do. All right. So just as soon as I told you that children don't de develop object permanence or symbolic objective self-representation before two years of age, uh, this cognitive research in the video that we're going to watch for tomorrow's webinar is going to show you that kids demonstrate uh, uh, abilities that are very similar to objective self-awareness uh, at six and seven months of age. And maybe the reason that they can't uh, that they can't that they didn't look to Piaget like they developed objective self-awareness was because they didn't have the motor control to follow up their knowledge structure. So maybe Piaget was missing some things. All right. Now, the modern cognitive research, uh, developmental approach is going to be represented by the uh, video that we watched last week, the video that we watched this week, and the video that we watched next week uh, called The Baby Human. Uh, to walk, uh, to think, and to feel uh, is going to be uh, the, these three videos. And these three videos do a great job demonstrating the modern cognitive developmental approach approach. Did class start later today? I'm not sure what you mean, M Melanie, Michaela. Uh, class started at one o'clock. Um, so uh, these Neo-Piagetians or the modern cognitive psychologists use modern methods of data gathering. Remember last week we talked about habituation studies, visual preference studies, um, uh, uh, eye tracking research, uh, uh, event-related potentials, EEG brain scans, and they try to assess more carefully not only how children develop knowledge, but what kinds of knowledge and abilities do they develop, and when do they develop these knowledge and abilities. Okay, uh, the PowerPoint is actually, oh, I just connected it to the uh, lecture slide. I put it in the lessons folder about a half an hour before class. Okay, now they focus on the development of specific types of cognitive abilities. When do we develop number sense? When do we develop math sense? How do we develop concept sense? Do we understand the laws of physics, that solid objects can't move through other solid objects, that objects don't float through the air invisibly. When do children learn that? And when you watch the baby human to think tonight and, th and, and watch that video, you are going to be amazed at the way in which they creatively test these abilities and knowledge in children. Okay? And what they argue is that maybe children have these core knowledge abilities that they build on. So maybe we all have a linguistic sense that we build on. Maybe we're all born with a mathematical sense. Maybe we're all born with a physics sense. So uh, what these people argue is that we have these general, if you will, tendencies or abilities that we then have to develop. So you're not born understanding physics, but you have sort of an automatic ability to develop the understanding of physics. You're not born understanding math, uh, understanding mathematical functions, but you have a mathematical sense, a potential, if you will. So think of the core knowledge approach as arguing that all humans are born with cognitive potentials in different areas and that 
what we do over the course of our early infancy and uh, in early childhood is develop these core knowledges from their potentials to real life applications. All right. And there is a focus on the emerging field of developmental cognitive science. Not only are they trying to figure out what children know and when they know it, but we're trying to tie it to different areas of the brain so we can sort of map the relationship between brain maturation and brain abilities. And you know what? A lot of the things that these researchers have discovered have allowed us to build milestone expectations for children's cognitive, social, and language development. So we can now track lots more abilities than just the uh, gross and fine motor milestones that were conceptualized by Arnold Giselle back in the 1930s. Okay, I'm just going to talk briefly about some of these cons, uh, some of the things that they've uh, researched. One thing that uh, psychologists are interested in is how when does the ability to form a concept and to differentiate between different concepts or to categorize information, when does con conceptual ability and categorization formation occur? And what your book is going to talk about is concepts are sort of a cognitive grouping of similar objects, events, people, or ideas. So if I gave you a bunch of animals, you could divide them into animals that fly and animals that don't fly. You could develop them into uh, you could divide them into animals that are big and animals that are small. And you know what? I'll bet you smart college students could probably even uh, organize them into categories of mammals and non-mammals, right? So the ability to form a concept and then to categorize things is a very fundamental function of the intellectual process. In fact, that's what I'm doing here today is I'm showing you new categories. I'm helping you categorize human developmental potential into things that make sense to you and me and relate to how humans function. So I'm really trying to give you categories and concepts in this class. And so how do these this ability to categorize develop? Now, uh, what your book suggests that during this age, uh, children actually learn to categorize things fairly quickly uh, based on how they look or what we would call perceptual categorization. So children can gather, categorize, categorize things based on perceptual features such as color, size, and similarity of appearance by about three to four months of age. But uh, the ability to understand different categories, uh, uh, things that fly, things that don't fly, uh, animals and non-animals, those uh, that ability to categorize, that abil the ability to categorize conceptually actually develops before the first year, but uh, several months later, seven to nine months. And if you think about it, what does an adult do during the first several months of life? They carry their baby around and they show them everything. See the doggy? See the nice doggy? I showed my kid a dog. See the TV? This is a TV. We're taking a bath. Here's your toe. Here's your nose. Here's your cute little ear. Here's your cute little ear. Here's your cute little nose. We basically are walking around showing kids and helping them develop their concepts in their categories. Now, your book suggests that there is a big difference in uh, category interests between the genders, the ability to differentiate and use these categories and the interest in using these categories. Look at this. Boys more interested in vehicles, trains, machines, and dinosaurs and balls uh, as opposed to girls being more interested in dress-ups, books, baby dolls, and uh, animals. Why do you think this is? Do you think there's biological differences between boys and girls at this age in terms of what kinds of things they find interesting? I'd be curious in your opinion at this point. I'll wait for just a second. Okay, I'm going to carry on as, that, as you answer that question. 
Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to sit here and make you answer me. Who's focusing on me? Come on, if you're listening, talk back at me. Shashan, you want to type in? Why do little boys and girls differ in the kinds of categories that they're interested in? Is it biological or is it learned? Oh, you're not helping me today. I'm going to argue that maybe this even represents the beginnings of gender role socialization. When we get to early childhood, we're going to talk about gender role socialization. And you can think about it starting as early as uh, in the crib. Uh, actually, when you come home for the hospital, little boys are wearing blue, little girls are wearing pink, right? Uh, we paint the little boy's room blue and put fire trucks and fire engines in it. We paint the little girl's room pink and we put baby dolls and rocking chairs and and, and, and what we perceive to be as female things in that room. And it does depend on what the parents teach them. So uh, do you think it's worthwhile to bring up gender neutral kids or is there something useful in having this difference in categorization tendency? That's a question to think about. All right. Uh, you know what? Uh, re there's also been research on infant memory. Um, now, uh, Piaget argued that infants cannot keep anything in their mind, so out of sight, out of mind. So according to Piaget, memory uh, shouldn't exist until around the age of two years. Now, memory is definitely, um, there's uh, what we might call childhood amnesia. Before about the age of two or three, you don't have the biological uh, maturity to remember what we would call episodic things, what happened to you when you're one. Nobody remembers what happened to them when they were one or one and a half or even two. So we don't have those memory abilities, but we do have simple memories starting early in life before the first year. And so uh, infants actually mimic facial expressions within the first few days of life. You can do a weird face and the little baby will mimic that face. Now, the cool thing is, is that uh, a fellow named Andrew Meltzoff has actually shown that children can do that imitation even if the time to imitate is deferred, that is put off for a while. So he found that six month old babies remember a facial expression for almost 24 hours. Nine month old babies remember a facial expression that they were shown for over a month. And by the time your child gets to 13 or 14 months old, they, they can remember something, uh, a facial expression that they were shown for four to six months. So memory does develop early in life. Uh, it's just not the kind of uh, uh, episodic memory that Piaget was interested in. Oh. Okay, good enough. Well, you know what? We are at 137. So here's the deal. Um, your book doesn't talk an awful lot about the details of the cognitive developmental perspective. It's not going to give you all of the different strands of research uh, that are um, that are being done right now. However, when you watch the video tomorrow night or for tomorrow night's class, uh, they're going to show you pretty much all of the different concepts uh, that, that developmental psychologists study in infancy. The development of number, uh, the development of, uh, of, of uh, understanding of physics, uh, memory, uh, their, uh, the facial uh, uh, objective self-awareness, and object, uh, objective self-representation and object awareness. Uh, uh, that video that we're going to watch for tomorrow night is going to show you uh, the progression of these abilities during the first uh, two, two years of life. Now, I'm probably not going to test you on the research details. Okay, there are a ton of details in that video. Uh, but what I might ask you about are the general research methods that they use uh, to test for the development of these intellectual abilities in children. Does anybody have any questions uh, about today's lecture? 
So just remember, Piaget had organizing forces of cognitive development, and we have these schemas that we either assimilate or accommodate. He argued that human beings go from uh, non-symbolic to symbolic and not logical, to logical but not abstract, to logical and abstract. He argues that our mind uh, evolves through four stages. Uh, he, dim he suggested that uh, humans are not symbolic because he didn't think they could demonstrate object permanence or objective self-representation. He argued that during this stage, we move from reflexes to primary circular behaviors to more complex combinations of circular behaviors uh, to becoming little scientists that begin allow us to internalize a scheme, uh, a symbolic representation of the world. Uh, Piaget was a little bit uh, vague in what he said how these abilities developed. Um, he used a case study methodology, which is not the strongest case study methodology, and he was too conservative in his estimates of children abilities. The neocognitive uh, approach uses more scientific, rigorous, experiential, experimental models to, to uh, detail exactly what children learn and when they learn it during the first uh, two years of life. They argue that we have these core knowledge systems that develop through experience. So we have number sense and that allows us to develop mathematical ability. We have physics sense that allows us to develop an understanding of how the world works. We have linguistic sense and that allows us to develop language. And they argue that, uh, uh, that the things that we learn how to form concepts in the first year of life and that these concepts may be de de dependent upon gender role socialization, uh, that we do have memories, the ability to hold representations in our mind during the first year, even though uh, we don't have the ability to remember episodic events that happened to us during, memory, during infancy. Hopefully everybody understands, uh, uh, got something from that lecture today. Don't forget to read your chapter and watch the video for tomorrow night's class. Um, if you don't have any questions for me, I'm going to go ahead and end the broadcast for the day. Thanks to everybody for coming. I do appreciate uh, your attendance. Uh, are you sure you don't have any questions for me? All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to log off now. Uh, take care, and I will see you tomorrow afternoon uh, in the webinar. Bye.